Hey everybody, uh, welcome to the Ask the Sensei, um, the Bio Dojo's uh, free webinar, free monthly webinar. I'm Tish Hicks, the Master Sensei here in uh, Burbank, California, and we are joined by our amazing techno sensei, Dan Leonard. Hey, Dan. And uh, each month we ask a um, wonderful, powerful, esteemed colleague of ours uh, to join us uh, to answer questions as a guest sensei. And we are very blessed to have Sean Pratt here joining us, sharing his expertise in uh, nonfiction audiobooks, although I'm sure he can answer questions about lots of other things as well. So, um, yeah. Um, well, let's 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 get started. Um, the uh, let's see a little bit about the dojo. We're a full training center based here in Burbank. Um, so wherever you are in your journey, there's something we can guide you to. Um, Dan, if you want to introduce yourself and uh, talk a little bit about all the goodness that you bring, and then Sean will will have you uh, introduce your stuff. And I love the stuff that we were just chatting about. Your, your origin story and <laughs> so but Dan introduce yourself and tell yeah us. uh thanks Tish yeah uh I'm I'm the home studio master you know there's there's nothing more specific and personal than your personal home voiceover studio and uh, what I do is I teach you how to do it properly there's lots of different opinions about certain things but the fact of the matter is most people are experts in one studio their own and they cannot serve as an expert for you what you need is somebody like myself who can who has done hundreds and hundreds of home studios and i know what it's supposed to sound like and uh, we'll teach you how to get it to sound right in your particular home studio and it's great to have sean pratt on here today because he's amazing <laughs> and with that sean can you introduce yourself and tell us about your goodness Oh, <laughs> unmute him. Oh, unmute. Okay, it's a voiceover thing. <laughs> there we go. There we go. We're okay. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Okay. Oh, good. He doesn't even tap, need. Tap tap tap. Is this thing on? <laughs> um, uh, let's see. So, um, quick biography about me. I uh, grew up doing theater here in Oklahoma City, and went off to get my BFA in acting uh, after high school. Graduated. Um, with my degree and from the College of Santa Fe in New Mexico and went off to New York to be a classical theater actor. And I worked around the country doing regional theater and also off Broadway with a repertory classical theater company there. And then <clears throat> I discovered, I ran into audiobooks uh, out of chance. I was doing a play in Washington DC in 1994 and I ran into uh, an actor in the show with me named David Hilder, who's now a playwright in New York City. And one day in the green room, I asked him, so what is it you do when you're not working? And he said, oh, I narrate audiobooks." And I said, well, what's that? Mm -hmm. I had no idea. <laughs> I, mean, yeah, I mean, I knew what they were like at the library, you know, you mm -hmm. saw the cassette boxes and stuff. And then um, I, uh, uh, he explained it to me and it was interesting, but I wasn't necessarily interested in doing it. So I, um, uh, I thanked him, you know, thanks for the information. And he said, well, you know, if you ever happen to move down to this area, I can introduce you to some people. And I said, oh, okay. And sure enough, two years later, I did move down there. Um, and he uh, hooked me up with Grover Gardner, who's a real icon in our industry. Mm -hmm. And uh, Grover got me into audiobooks. He, I pestered him enough and he cut a demo and I started, so this is 96. And my very first book with Blackstone Audio was Cabbages and Kings by O. Henry. Wow. And, um, and now, uh, at the end of December, my very last book, which will be number 1,000 for the year, for the my career, uh, will be also from Blackstone Audio. It's a Western. So um, <laughs> nice little bookend on, on the numbers. So On, on a um, quarter of a decade. That's yeah. fantastic. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's ironic. I haven't told Grover. Grover just sent me this script uh, a few days ago, and um, I was looking at it. And it's a really cool Western. I'm very excited. I don't do a lot of fiction anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I initially, when I started narrating audiobooks, like a lot of us, we, I was a performer. So I, and also when I got into it, I wasn't that I had a burning desire to do it. It was just going to be one more thing I was going to add to my career. 
you know, as a freelance actor, you work on a play, then you have a day on a movie, then you do a VO, then you do a corporate video training film and you bounce back and forth. But I, audiobooks just happened to, I happened to be in the right place at the right time with the industry when it was really ramping up. Mm -hmm. And I was able to make my own home studio very quickly. Uh, a little tiny, tiny booth, which I call the Gemini capsule. It was so small. <laughs> and, um, but I did lots and lots of fiction initially, tons of it. And that's how I learned how to be a narrator. But after a couple of years, I got a little tired of doing lots and lots of fiction. It was, I was doing sort of B-level stuff. I was, you know, I was the new guy, so I didn't get the, the, the top you stuff. Came with, you came with the, in with the classic and then. <laughs> yeah, and that was my, yeah, I didn't see a lot of good stuff for a while. And, you know, so you're doing this sort of the same formulaic murder mystery or the same kind of Western. And then after a while, it was, it was just starting to get stale. And I had been pestering uh, Blackstone Audio and Books on Tape to send me more material. I just wanted stuff to narrate because I knew I had to do it in order to get better. And I tell this story, this, I, this is back in the ancient days when we used to record on tape, on VHS tape with an ADAT system. And um, this enormous, what they would do is they would mail you the book along with the ADAT tapes and also these, these high-end cassette tapes that you were to make a dub of. And that's the dub was what they made their production runs with. Oh. <laughs> the master was the VHS tape. So this enormous box is sitting on my front step. And I take it in and I open it up and inside is a five volume history of the state of California. And each one of those books clocked in at 30 hours. Wow. It was a 150 hour project. It took me about a, on and off about a year to do. Yeah, and so there was a note. You count that as Sorry? five of, you count that as five of the thousand or one of the thousand? Oh yeah. No, <laughs> five. I can call them five. If, they're, if it's bound up, it's a book for me. <laughs> and, um, you know, and that's the other thing, too. People say, you know, how many books have you done? And it's a thousand. And, you know, the term book is elastic. Mm -hmm. I've narrated books that were five hours long and books that were 50 hours long. So it's more about the project itself rather than the necessarily the length. But generally speaking, most of the books I do are between eight to 12 hours long on average. Hold on one so second. Anyway, so yeah. Go ahead. I want to, um, as as uh, as Sean is telling us about how he's gotten to where he is and what he does, um, want to invite everyone to, um, in the bottom uh, bottom menu bar, there's a question and answer Q and A folder. Um, but if you want to start putting in your questions, and obviously Sean's here, so we can talk about audiobooks and particularly nonfiction is is a specialty. But we are here to answer questions about anything that's on your mind. Um, I know who some who was it? It was um, I, I know someone had sent me some some questions earlier, but if you can put them into the into the question and answer, um, that'd be great. So let's get that process started, and we'll we'll um, we'll jump in and start answering some questions in just a few minutes. So okay, so then. <laughs> then what? Uh, so <laughs> you know, so I did the I did the book, and fortunately, the the books were very well written. And I worked with the author, who was the state librarian, Dr. Kevin Starr, really nice gentleman. And so I learned about research. And, and the thing was that I realized that was the missing link for me. Because mm. even as a child, when I would read books, yeah, I read the Hardy Boys mysteries, and I would read, you know, some, some fiction. But I, was always, I always joke that I would much rather read a book about how they built the pyramids rather than mummies chasing people around the pyramids. <laughs> right, you know right, right. I mean? So you, know, you, you were naturally drawn to nonfiction. Yeah, I mean, the, the fiction part was in growing up in the theater. You know, I, I, I started, like I said, I started acting when I was 10. Mm -hmm. So putting on costumes and makeups and make-believe was just natural. But I guess maybe as an antithesis to that in my personal life, I preferred to read about things that were real, as it were. And so that started immediately, the trend, and soon after I began to, the balance began to shift. You know, the, the right. number of books I did that were nonfiction grew every year until, I don't know, five years into my career, I was doing, I was up to 50 books a year mm -hmm. and easily 40 of those were nonfiction. And that's oh, well. pretty much the, the ratio it's stayed ever since. Yeah. I mean, this year I've done, this year I've done 46, 47 books. Wow. Um, and of those seven were fiction. You know, last year I did 40, uh, 55 books or something like that. So it varies year to year, but 
you know, but the, the ratio is far into nonfiction. And that's the specialty. That's what I coach mm-hmm. with my students one-on-one. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Um, and you were, you were starting to talk about, uh, when, uh, but as we were waiting for people to come on, you were starting to, to mention about how you've come to your process. Can you share a little bit about, just uh, a little bit about how you, you were talking about, um, um, God, what were the words that you just used? Um, oh, well, the, what I tell people is <clears throat> um, there's two styles of coaching, no matter what the topic you're learning from. There's tactical and strategic. A tactical coach, for instance, I had a, an acting coach in Manhattan when I was a theater actor. And so if I wanted to work with her, I'd schedule time to go to her studio in Chelsea. And then I'd come in with my monologue and I'd start performing the piece and she would give me immediate feedback. So Mm -hmm. there was no real prep on her part. I was paying for her years of experience as a director and and an actor. Well, when I decided I'd been doing workshops and I'd done career coaching for actors and stuff and workshops about the business of show business and audiobook workshops. But about five years ago, I was sort of tired of that. It's a lot of work to put on workshops Mm -hmm. and I don't do nearly as many now as I used to. And I decided I wanted to do one-on-one coaching, but I, I immediately realized I couldn't teach nonfiction in a tactical setting. So I became a strategic coach. I had to build a curriculum from scratch because nobody else teaches it. Yeah, and so I realized, I, people have yeah, there's too much. Nowadays. Nonfiction is just more difficult. I mean, uh, the goal we're trying to make with an audio book is, to me, the metric you measure whether or not it was successful was, was it an entertaining experience for the listener? And in fiction, it's pretty straightforward to do that. You have all these storytelling tools, but in nonfiction, we don't, we have just a handful of tools. There's no funny voices. There's no zombies or love scenes. And so you have to, it's just more difficult to achieve the goal of making it entertaining. Mm -hmm. And I liked that challenge, but I also realized there were so many different nuances in the world of nonfiction. Don't like in fiction, we have, you know, romance and action and noir and sci-fi and fantasy in the world of nonfiction we have memoir biography business self-help religious material uh sports books cookbooks uh, psychology books that are interactive they all do, they all require a slightly different style and you have to know how to get into them and then communicate those changes to the proofer and the publisher and that's also a big difference between right. nonfiction. we change stuff all the time in the text right you right. know and you have to know what, the, and there's, you know, I looked around, you know, like the style guides recently, I, I've developed a new class for my students about style guides and director's notes. I, um, I had a run in with a publisher who shall remain nameless <laughs> where I was a, it was a science book. It was really interesting. And this is several months ago. And um, I, uh, I finished the book and I sent in my, notes from the director to the proofer because when I record at home, I am the director. Well, I sent it to the company that was doing the mastering and they did the first round. I got my fixes. They finished it. And then they sent it over to the publisher, publisher X. And I'd also sent those notes in originally weeks when I turned in the original recording, but they never got passed on to the, their QC department. And then about a week later, I got this panicked email from everybody going, the proofers come back and said, you've added all this text and changed all this stuff. What's up with that? And I said, well, yeah, didn't they get my director's notes? And so I resent them. And then they, uh, they, they, they got them in and they looked them over. And the decision was made at the executive level to not make me go back and change all the stuff I changed back, which I would have if they had. I mean, it's just an audio book. It's not a right. hill to die on. But the point that made me upset was at the end of the whole process, the production manager at that company, at the, at the major publisher at their audio company arm, sent me this sort of terse email saying, well, in the future, when you record for us, just read what's on the page unless there's a typo. And <laughs> frankly, that's the stupidest damn thing I've ever heard in my life. Mm. You know, um, we change stuff in nonfiction all the time. Mm. And only the narrator in the trench understands that. Not that, you know, that's a, our area of expertise. I wouldn't tell the production manager how to get the books out the door. Right, you know, right. So I made a, I made a deliberate thing. I built, so I built a new lesson specifically about this issue of right, so asking a, an audio company for style guides and so on. Yeah. So, so you're, you're, you're talking, uh, you're talking the whole lot a lot about how you approach the whole thing. It's not just, are we working on this book? So oh no, I don't, I, I, 
when I work with my students, it's not just technique mm -hmm. about phrasing and tempo and melody yeah. and vocal production. We deal with marketing and advertising and networking. We deal with structure, find, finding work outside of ACX. Mm -hmm. So I'm, it's sort of, a, I, I want it to be a one-stop shop and that's why there's a curriculum because you can only give them so much information every session. It's right. only an hour, you know? Right, right, right. Yeah. And it's a year long, it's basically a year long course because, yeah. you know, they have lives. They're full-time exactly. narrators or day jobs. Yeah. So we meet basically once a month and, and uh, yeah, I've, 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 it seems that uh, um, as the ginger Yoda, as my students have <laughs> named me, uh, I've developed quite the reputation for the, the amount of homework I give my students to work on. Well, they all whinge about it online. If you're going to be working on audiobooks. You can't be shirking at the work. So. <laughs> yeah, it's true. That's absolutely true. That bothers you then, yeah. Well, let's, let's get to some questions. This is great, Sean. Yeah, um, sure. Obviously, yeah. We, we will, we, we know you, you know what you know this is great um well let's start with uh, an audiobook and then i've got a tech question for you dan that uh, was emailed to me um so jamie hey jamie how are you um asks what's your process when recording and do you read the books first excellent question um if it's fiction i always read the book first because you need to know is the mystery voice in chapter seven who that is as it's revealed in chapter 25. you're also thinking about performance you're researching tone and style, like the Western, and I'm prepping, I'm making notes about how the character voices are described and the rhythm of the piece, when other action sounds. So it's, it's all like actory stuff. Mm -hmm. But now in nonfiction, because of the volume of work I do, I don't read the book before I do it. I don't have time. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, either because I've, of the deadlines that I have or the deadlines a publisher will impose on me. So for instance, I just got a drop in book to do in December. They're going to get it to me like, I think this Friday, and I have to start on Monday. It's it's there's no way I can get it read and prepped in that time normally. Right. So, I have a little method I use where I can prep a book very quickly by looking for key elements of information. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is, is just as we as when we read, say, if you have a favorite detective series or romance series, as a reader, you read it because it's comfortable and you know what's coming. Right, you know the music of the book. In nonfiction, if you do, once you do enough of these, you begin to hear the music of the book immediately. The writer's oh. voice. Right, right, right. So by the time, so I read the intro, preface, and forward, and by the time I'm done there, mm. and skim to the rest of it, I know the music of the piece because I've narrated that book two dozen times before, as it were. Right, right. You know. Well, and then I think, I think as audiobook, as, as narrators, I mean, actually, as all voiceover people, we are the interpreters of the author's mm -hmm. voice. So if that's a piece yeah. of copy, then we are the musicians playing, playing the sheet music that the copyright yeah. has annotated so that we can read uh, that piece of copy. But we're really interpreting that, that copywriter's voice. Mm -hmm. um, and as whether we're working on fiction, we also have to uh, we also have to become on on the ultimate level we're the voice of the author because the author right. and and then how is that interpreted in the narration? But then as as nonfiction, we literally are becoming the voice of the yeah. author. Um, I say that uh, a good fiction writer has to develop an ear for dialogue, writing dialogue, and a good nonfiction writer has to develop an ear for writing monologue Ooh. because it's an extended performance. Yeah, there you go. Right, put that on a stone and hang it on your wall or something. Yeah, I know um, But the, it's true because, you know, the way I come at the performance, the shorthand I use when I teach my students, I call it the TED Talk theory of nonfiction narration. You build a, you build a little triangle. Who are you? And then you're always the author. Mm -hmm. And then you, who is the audience? And that's who the, the book was targeted for, the core right. audience. I don't, and when I narrate, I don't narrate to one person. I narrate to a group of people in my mind. Right, which, so, is, a different, which is a little bit different than how we approach copy. Yes, uh, that's a one-on-one. -on -one. Right. And um, the last thing I do is where, are, where would you be with the audience physically? Hmm. So that, the goal is so that the words on the page are actually the transcript of what you said. So the TED Talk is an easy idea. It's a nonfiction presentation. You're the expert. You walk out and there's an audience there that wants, to, that's, that's, they're waiting to be educated by you, right? So they're leaning forward, not sitting back as it were. Yeah. So 
So if you approach the text as if it's the transcript, you know, it's no different than a play, like, you know, to be or not to be, that is the question, as opposed to, in my book on investing in Wall Street, we'll talk about, well, it's the same thing. Right, right, right. You yeah. Can, you know, so that, I... <clears throat> That, that's the one of one of the key concepts that we work with here at the dojo is mm -hmm. uh, any is is the semantic shift of reading transforming into sharing and what you just said because any jimmy can walk up who knows who's, who knows how to read any jimmy can walk up and read something but we share it we we take it right. in and share it and when you set up that activated thing you're not just and here's another page and here's an oh I'm oh yeah, no, that's the worst. Relation. It becomes, yeah, it's an audio. That becomes an audio sleeping pill if you're not careful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is one more reason why nonfiction is more difficult because when you have actors who, you know, I have friends, peers, and colleagues who are very good at um, uh, doing um, uh, fiction, but they really struggle with nonfiction because they can't make that conceptual leap and sustain it. Right. To see right. the audience in their head, and then sustain that in their mind's eye and i use like i said i use the term ted talk is just a catchphrase yeah you know sometimes i'm you know i'm the head uh i'm, I'm teaching salespeople how to be better sales people or i'm an economist talking about upcoming economic trends in the united states or a psychologist talking about ptsd right you know right. exactly but it's it's an easy idea but the idea is it's your ability to sustain it yeah over the course of days as you work through the material yeah. What else we have? Um, let's see. Well, um, I was going to switch to a tech question for Dan, but he, okay. oh, he had to jump out on the So uh, we'll we'll get him back. Um, okay. Let's pop through a couple. Get some get some rhythm. Speaking of music and getting the rhythm going. There you go. Um, Mary uh, asks, "Does representation help you book projects?" That's an interesting thing. Um, you know, I have of all the books that I've done, all one thousand. I have never used an agent or a manager. Mm -hmm. In fact, most agents and managers don't want to touch audiobooks because right. there's not enough money in it for them. Yeah, especially the DO people. Yeah. Yeah. So in a way, though, I think of that as being very freeing because if you're willing to do a little bit of the, the, the you know, metaphorically pound the sh pavement, you can keep all your money and you get to, get to control the stuff you go after. Mm-hmm. So it, a lot of my, a number of my students, when they come to me, they're a little gun shy about that aspect, which is why I walk them through things about marketing and advertising mm -hmm. and demos and things like that. So that by the time they graduate out of my program, they have a, they understand the lay of the land of audiobooks and why it's different from commercial VO mm -hmm. yeah. and, and that no one's going to do this for them. And yeah. ironically, it's also, it's also can be, the pitfall for a lot of my students or other, other people in audiobooks generally. Uh, I've known a lot of really talented performers over the, my period of work as an actor who have left and it's because they couldn't or they wouldn't master the business side of show business. Right. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, and today that means things like having a good website, being active on social media, going to conferences, hunting down work at writers conferences, uh, being, you know, it, it, it requires a, that is part of the process now. And a lot of people just want to narrate. It's, it's building relationship, right? Yes. Yeah. I was, I was saying, I was saying as we were coming on and asking people to say where they're coming from, that, you know, yeah. so this work is we do it alone in our little boxes and it's really important to remember a how many other people are here in this community doing it. You know, that's one of the premises of the dojo. We are a community doing sure. this. Um, and, but then also um, how you are, you constantly have to be reaching out of your book. No one gets to just read. Um, you, you, the only reason you're there reading is because you're in relationship with, with, with somebody, with somebody else. Yeah. Metaf well, metaphorically or in your imagination. Right. Well, I mean, but, but uh, in terms of when you're doing the work, yes. But literally, who gave you the job? That's someone you have a relationship with. Well, you know, I have books come to me privately all the time mm -hmm. because I am active on social media. Mm -hmm. You know, this year I've fielded four offers through LinkedIn. Wow, that's cool. Business others. I've uh, I get I've, I've fielded I don't know three or four books through Twitter this year. Wow, that's cool. Um, uh, one through. 
well, I'm negotiating one through Instagram at present mm-hmm. to see if it comes out. Yeah. And then people find me on Facebook and, of course, my website. Yeah. But it's that old cliche about the tree falling in the forest and if no, you know, it doesn't make a sound if you don't tell people what you're up to. And the, the problem that people have, I found, with social media usage is they have three big obstacles that stand in their way, performers in general. The first obstacle they run into is cultural. And that's the thing about, they think, well, we've been brought up as kids not to brag about our achievements, right? (laughs) But that's not what I'm telling my students to do. I'm saying, you're just telling them what you're doing. You're not saying you're the greatest narrator in the world. You're just saying (laughs) you're a working narrator. And there's a big difference. Mm -hmm. So, So I say, you know, when I post, I don't say, look at me, I'm the greatest. I'm just saying, I'm working on a book. Or one of my students graduated, but you're, it's about being present. Right. Right. The, the second obstacle they run into is procrastination. That's a killer. They keep putting off posting. And when I, like, I had a student this morning and I've been on him for months. I'm like, so how, how are you doing on your posting? I asked them to just do Monday, Wednesday, Friday, mm-hmm. three times a week. And he like, you know, look shame face. It's, not, it's a very uncomfortable thing to have to scold someone who's almost old enough to be your father. <laughs> uh, but I'm like, look, you, you, you keep telling me you want to work. And I'm telling you this is an avenue to get it. Mm-hmm. And you won't do it. So what does that tell me about your level of commitment to doing this for real? Right. So the way you get around that is you have to schedule it. Right. And, those are, and what's the third thing? And, um, the third thing is cynicism. You know, you start doing this and nothing happens 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 happens until suddenly it does. And it's that, you know, that you've seen that cartoon of the guy digging the tunnel into the mountain and he turns around and leaves right before he gets the diamonds. Right, right, right. You know, and it, uh, when I, it's, I jokingly tell my students when I teach them about this stuff, about being on social media and emailing people, I say, once you start this, the only reason you're going to stop is either either you quit being a narrator or you die. This has to become part of your wow by breathing. It has to. Yeah. You know, I do it. I still do it. Everybody right. does it. And and you know that that's very true. And and also I think understanding that the audiobook world is it's like its own little ecosystem. It's definitely a part of yep. it's part of your um voiceover portfolio if mm-hmm. you choose it to be but like any of voiceover nobody cares if you do it or not really yeah. um and and you know it's kind of like i also uh, i also say uh, you know audiobooks are kind of like marathon runners you can be a runner but then there's a certain percentage of people that are marathon runners and then there's even you know people who do marathons of marathons and so right. you have to understand that it's sort of its own ecosystem and how it works and how you work in it so yeah i say Huge. i have lots of friends in la and new york who are vo you know they do cartoons and radio mm-hmm. spots and and when i tell them about my work day they look at me as if i'm crazy you know, <laughs> how long do you sit in there you know because they're used to going into their booth or their studio right. or going on location and working for 30 minutes an hour yeah, and walking out and in six minutes you know? day. yeah right and they're done and and you know when i said no i'm in there for hours a day mm-hmm. and they can't wrap their head around and that's <laughs> that's what i say i say one of the defining features in the world of vo that separates audiobook narrators from the other vo people is a matter of temperament mm-hmm. not talent can mm-hmm. you sit by yourself hour after hour eating the elephant as i call it right you know one forkful at a time and, you know, and it, it can seem a little, especially in nonfiction, you know, you work all day to do a one finished hour, you've done 20 pages or 30 pages tops. Right, and the right. book is 300 pages long or 400 pages long. And you start to panic. Right. Like, oh my God, I'll never get through this. And you have to approach the material in a different way. Yeah. You're just going to keep gnawing the, at it. I love that you have a, a great, um, um, I don't know if it's a YouTube video or something on your website, but just a little um, gauntlet for people to run through. Are you interested in audiobooks? Do this oh. and then call me. So t- check yeah. out this thing. I want to get Dan on here. Um, okay. This is all huge, brilliant stuff. Um, Dan, I wanted to share a question that Jeff Holman uh, sent in. And um, let me see if I can find it. Um, Jeff wrote earlier. 
Um, it's taking me far too long to edit because mouth noise. Um, I stay hydrated uh, with various things, still have problems with mouth noise. Advised to purchase a plug-in from Isotope called D-Click, but every time I try to use it, it leaves artifacts. Um, even with the sensitivity set at three, what am I doing wrong? And what do I need to do to solve my mouth noise? Any advice would be appreciated. Um, and also loud breathing. So those are his. Oh, well, those, that's a pretty standard question that I get all the time. And uh, it's, it's actually pretty basic. Uh, if there's a number of reasons that we're, we're hearing a lot of mouth noise. One, uh, you're not relaxed. You're simply trying to be a voice actor, and it usually comes from voice over acting. Uh, and, and the fact is, is it comes from pushing your tongue too hard against your upper palate. It comes from using your tongue too much against your teeth. It's because you're trying to enunciate uh, things very, very carefully, and that tends to create that sort of thing. My philosophy is do everything you can physically to fix that type of a problem. That means relax, uh, hydrate yourself, uh, don't push your, your, your voice so hard. Um, there are some, you know, there's lots of different physical remedies that lots of people recommend. You know, one of the, the popular ones is Granny Smith apples. Um, I use a product called Alkalol, not alcohol, Alkalol, which you can get. <laughs> uh, Drunk all the time. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, 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 usually doesn't help a whole lot. Um, and, um, it, you get it at the drugstore. It's A L K O L O L. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, ask for that. It comes in a bottle, mix it 20 to one into a spray bottle, which I happen to have right in front of me here. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, spray it about 10, 10 times in your mouth, swish it around, spit it out, uh, you know, preferably in a flower bed somewhere. And, um, and it, it, I, you know, I'm able to do long form narration without any problem. Also, don't eat chocolate before you work. Don't eat anything spicy before you work. Um, and if anybody tells you that it's microphone technique, uh, talk off axis or one of those things, they really don't know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. The way to fix it is physically. Uh, if you go to, if you try to rely on technology to fix these things, you are asking for more trouble than you're creating uh, with, with the mouth noise. Um, you know, occasionally you'll have one in there and, you know, I use Adobe Audition and you can highlight things and take individual clicks out. But if you start to use things and you don't know how to use them, you are asking for trouble. But and that, that sounds, it sounds like what's happening with Jeff, that he's trying to solve the problem and it's creating more problems, which is... Exactly. So, physically first. Right. And the, what I'm hearing you say also is um, it's, not about, it's not about mic technique in terms of position, but just in terms of, of um, how much energy and, and how you're articulating things. Right. Yeah, you'll, you'll notice that when you're talking to other people, you don't make a lot of mouth noise. Right. Uh, or, yes. or sometimes so, I think I've, I've heard of, of people having consistent issues and then there is something physiologically going on, which would be more of a speech pathologist or ENT sort of thing, maybe even a right. speech pathologist, like, oh, there's something that happens. Right. Again, it's a, it's a physical thing. So you got to deal with the physical. And if you try to hide it, it's not a good idea. You know, and I'm sure there are people out there that will argue with me saying, oh, no, no, this, this plug in does great for you. Right, right, right. And then, and then um, there's sort of a, a several questions about the breath thing, too. Okay. Uh, breath, uh, leaving breaths in. And yeah, the, well, it, yeah. And, and that's an interesting one, too, because one of the things you can do about breaths is, one, be in good physical condition. So you, can, you should be able to read at least a sentence or two without taking a breath and forcing it. Uh, if you're taking a breath between every phrase – there's the problem is not your your ability to be a voice actor or a, you know or a, something that you can try and fix uh you know using technology the idea is to learn to talk longer and not take breaths unless it calls for a dramatic breath or something along those lines which i'm sure sean can uh, you know to attest to um if you know i have a tendency to breathe deep too as well and if i come to the end of a sentence i might go <clears throat> and hopefully not cough. And um, 
and and one of the things you can do you can edit it out or just silence it or if you take a somewhat louder breath than normal in the middle of a sentence or between between sentences one of the things you can do is highlight it and take it down 15 db and suddenly it sounds a whole lot more natural so it's it's just quiet yeah can yeah. i can i build off on what dan is saying Absolutely. another problem so so everything dan says is spot on um two things i would also bring up are how you breathe okay mm -hmm. so um generally a lot of people and I know this sounds odd, they breathe incorrectly when they're working. They breathe up here. It's a shallow breath, right? They, it's, like, it's like when you're at the doctor and they put the stethoscope and they breathe and they want you to go, right? And so you're breathing. You do this physical thing where you raise your shoulders and, you're, and that has nothing to do physiologically with the actual <laughs> breath. Of course, the diaphragm goes down, creating the vacuum for the air to come in. And so you have to learn the technique that singers use, which is called lower rib breathing where you learn to breathe really low down. There's plenty of YouTube videos on this. Mm -hmm. I had to learn it as a theater actor. We did it every before every show as a warm up. I did but too. Another problem, yeah. And, uh, but another problem I've discovered with my students is, okay, so generally speaking, when, we, uh, when we're narrating through a paragraph, the pause we take between sentences is between zero to about two seconds. Zero meaning we drive right into the next sentence, Two seconds means we come to the end of the sentence and now we're into the next beat, right? Mm -hmm. What happens that I've discovered with people who have consistent breath on mic is that they're taking a catch breath. And the reason they're doing it is psychologically they know they're supposed to take a pause. So let's say it's two seconds for the sake of the argument. But what they do is they take the two second pause, but they don't breathe until the last half second. So they, they end the sentence like this, and then they breathe as opposed to ending the sentence and then taking two seconds for the full breath and then keep going. Right. Oh, and that's when you do a catch, yeah. When you do a catch breath, the mic will pick it up every time. That's fascinating. And then at the dojo, one of the things we talk about is um, approaching work organically, or organically first and then technically, because mm. the philosophy here is if you know what you're talking about, and who you're talking to and why you're mm -hmm. talking, you never run out of breath, you never need to adjust your volume and you never choose which word to emphasize, you just because you're sharing it and your thoughts are ahead of the words. When you're reading, your thoughts are behind the words. So as narrators, we are reading and especially if we're if we're if we're reading along with you, babies, <laughs> if we haven't read before, then we're we're reading a little bit ahead in our brains. Mm. But, but to keep that, I think it goes back to what what Sean was talking about sharing, right? And then also, um, um, in a TED talk, you're always gauging: Are you with me? Are you with me? Are you with me? So it's a monologue, but you still need to be aware that people are with you and. I find that a lot of that technical stuff takes care of itself and then you can tweak it from there. Yeah. In other yeah. words, it's technique more than it is trying to physically or trying to use technology to fix it. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. There's another little trick that I, I teach my students that's unique to nonfiction. Oh, well, you can, you can find it in fiction, but it's, it's, it's definitely in nonfiction. So you know how it is when we're, if you're, let's say you're watching a movie and it comes to the end of a dramatic scene and it goes to black and there's a, a long beat in darkness before the next scene starts. And that, that darkness represents a visual breather for the audience to go, okay, that scene's over with, now we're going to start something new. And you have that usually at the end of a chapter in fiction, mm -hmm. right? What I teach my students is when we're doing nonfiction, especially dense material, like a book on physics or PTSD or investment or Bitcoin or whatever, you're, you're talking through some very dense ideas. And what I teach my students is that when we come to the end of a paragraph, it's good to take a slightly longer pause between paragraphs, so say three to five seconds, gauged on how complex the previous paragraph was. And what you're teaching the listener over time is, okay, and that's all I wanted to say about that idea. Right. Now yeah. let's start this new idea. Yeah. And by having that little beat, you allow the listener, you teach them to go, oh, okay, I can put that one to bed now. We're going to move on. It's a, now, that is technique. But after you get enough, of, uh, once it becomes ingrained, it just becomes, you know, something that you do uh, without thinking about. But initially, yeah. 
You have to do it with a purpose. And the same thing is with the breath. You have to practice that lower rib breathing enough that you don't even think about it. And, oh. and I saw to, to build off that too is I never narrate when I'm full. I never narrate if I've just come back from the gym or if I'm you know agitated, like if I've taken like medicine and my heart's racing or whatever, because I'm not going to be able to breathe well enough. And so I, that, that's something you have to think about. You're going to struggle the whole session. Yeah. It, can be it, so, also, it also ties into what you're saying earlier about finding the music, about hearing the yeah. music of the, of the piece that, the, and then that, yeah. yeah. Great. This is super cool. Um, let's see. We've got that one. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, what are the best publishers for nonfiction, especially for newcomers? Um, Lisa says she's in that limbo phase of working, but not Audible approved yet. Oh, um, well, the, all the, I mean, there are some specialty houses that publish almost nothing but nonfiction, like John Wiley and Sons. Um, you know, you would just, you would have to, a lot of the publishers that specialize in nonfiction are basically imprints of larger publishers. They've been snapped up by the big ones, like by Harper oh, yeah. Collins or Penguin mm -hmm. Random House. Um, so really in effect, when you're dealing, looking for that kind of project, ultimately it goes back to Penguin Random House or Harper Collins, whoever's doing the casting. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you're on ACX and you're dealing with nonfiction and you want a real crash course, I would recommend looking for material that's put out by university press. Mm -hmm. Margie Bauman and her husband run that company. I've known Margie for over 20 years and she does almost nothing but nonfiction. Now it's royalty share only, but I think it's, and they tend to be larger projects, not all of them very sexy, mm -hmm. but um, I think it's a good place to get your feet wet with nonfiction. That's a great thing. Because you're, you're going to learn to direct, you're going to learn to research, you're going to need, you're going to learn something that I think is key in nonfiction is if you can make a book about Bitcoin, sexy and fun and exciting and interesting, mm -hmm. you can do anything. Right. So the challenge is there. It's easy to have a great story when it's, there's, you know, like I said, zombies and love scenes and funny right. voices. <laughs> and even in the world of nonfiction, you can have a really fun piece of nonfiction that's humorous or very topical. But it's when you get into the deep stuff. I mean, I just did a book a few weeks ago for Gildan. Uh, it was, I don't know, 10 hours long. It was on corporate culture change. Say that three times every paragraph. <laughs> um, it was a monster, and, but it was very dense. And so that's why I got the book. It's sort of a backhanded compliment. I got the book because it was so dense and they knew they could give it to me and I would have the best shot at turning it into something entertaining. But I would say University Press is a good place to start through ACX. Um, all the other smaller publishers, like I said, have been snapped up by the big ones pretty much. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and uh, Lisa also asks, uh, what, um, what, is the, what is the industry standard <laughs> this week for length of sample demo? Um, to okay, so I'll, I'll, just speak, I'll just speak with for nonfiction. Mm -hmm. Okay. So... Um, so when I'm working with my students for their ACX demos, I say the sample should be three to five minutes for one selection in one genre from one book. Unlike commercial video demos, it's not a selection of five different things in three minutes. They want to hear you tell a story that starts with its own beginning, middle, and end. Now, every publisher, like if you were to put up your demos on ahab.us, which is Penguin Random Houses, they want a slightly shorter version, so you just have to edit it down. And that's another thing. You should be feel free to edit down the material you want to narrate. If you, if you find a really good piece you like, but it's six minutes long, well, then edit down to five or four minutes. No one's going to know. They're not going to care. Hmm. But the best place, two things to think about when you're dealing with nonfiction demos. The first is when you're looking for material, just know that they cast nonfiction material to the age of the narrator's voice. I'm, I'm gonna be 53 this Christmas, but I don't sound 53. So I have a pretty big window of material I can still narrate. Whereas I have students who are younger than me, they sound like they're in their 50s. They just, for them, they maybe they smoke or they've got a big baritone or whatever. But when you're looking for material, think about how, what age does your voice sound like? Mm, so let's say you sound like, okay, so you sound like you're in your 40s, let's pretend, right? 
So if it's a man in his 40s, so what kind of self-help books would be interesting for a man in his 40s? What mm -hmm. kind of business books? Contemporary culture. Um, and then the best place to find the material for the demo itself is in the intro, preface, or forward of the nonfiction because they're the, the authors laying out their intellectual idea in a short form. Mm -hmm. And they're also trying to create a sense of interest. Like, you know, uh, when I teach you these five steps to investing in Bitcoin, this, 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 and this, you're going to make a million dollars. So let's go. That's cool. That's the kind of, yeah, that's what you want in a nonfiction demo. Okay. Um, now fiction's a different story. It's, you know, I'm sure you'll have some, somebody who does lots of fiction who has a different take on it, but, especially in nonfiction, they want to see, can you sustain this read beyond mm -hmm. two minutes? You know? So, so then so if, the if you were looking at, if you wanted to cover a couple of different things you would do, you'd be, you would do three minute sections of several different types and then label them so that they would look at it. Okay. So what I would do is, okay. So I would have one that says nonfiction, self-help slash exercise, mm -hmm. nonfiction, business slash investing. And it's from one book. So it's on a book, one book about business investing, not right. several, one. Okay. And then you had nonfiction contemporary culture. I would uh, have the people. Per, per, per three to five minutes through the subgenres of, of nonfiction. Yes. Okay. Right. That's, so that's if you, if, if, the, if the viewers, if you guys want to go check out my demos on my page, you'll see uh, how they're labeled. They're generic because when they're looking for, type they you know if i said if i had a book and the name of the book was carmax <laughs> you have no idea what that means right. right there's no idea what that means and it turns out that it's a book about marketing but it's called carmax and you're like well what the so if you had it it says nonfiction, marketing slash something right you right. so you get the genre and maybe what it means within the genre yeah because right? that's how they're going to look it up yeah, that, that's really helpful. Um, Joni asks a great question. How does narrating nonfiction book differ from e-learning projects other than maybe being longer and not personal narrative, but you do both. So how do you approach yeah. them? Um, at its core, they're exactly the same, hmm. which is an interesting thing for a lot of people when I talk about it because it's nonfiction. And if you can set the construct up that you're the expert, the author. Now I know that uh, e-learning is you know, it's usually written by committee at some company, <laughs> but I always approach it. Like there's one piece that I use in my textbook that I have my students work from. It's a e-learning module from, uh, from Toyota. It's called the Toyota mentoring program. Okay. Welcome to the Toyota mentoring program. We're going to blah, blah, you know, so I say, set up the triangle. Who are you? Mm. And I say, I give it a backstory. So if I were narrating it, I'd say, well, Okay, um, I went through the program at one point. I was successful as a mentor, and now they've asked me to lead the program. So now I'm the head of the Toyota mentoring program. I'm in a room with 50 other employees who've signed up for this thing and in a conference room, and they all want to join. So there's my triangle once again. Mm -hmm. And That's then you act it. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. So, yeah, the, to me, the worst thing you can do in e-learning is you think, oh, it's, it's just e-learning, so I'll just read the thing, you know. Welcome to the Toyota Mentoring Program. We are so happy you are here. To, you know. That substitute. <laughs> the only other difference I would say is, is structural or when you're in the trenches with it. One of the things I advise people to do with e-learning is if you, you get the text, okay? And we've all had this happen. If you've done e-learning or corporate narration, this thing has been through 15 different levels of, of QC from writing and the legal team. And you get it and you go, quality control, right? For there's not a verb in this sentence or something. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You get texts like that. And so what I, what I tell my students is do it one take, a, you know, you, you have to do them by, by, by a uh, little tiny section, you know, section 1090, section 1091 and so on, file, whatever. Give it to them once as written and then do an alternate right after that as a separate file, the way you think it should be done. And just send it in and say, look, I've given you an alternate on this. I think it's missing this word. Well, and that way you don't have to ask. Right. You don't have to ask permission. Right. And you don't have 15 emails back and forth. You just do it. If they don't want to do it, they'll just delete it. Right. But, it, but if they do use it, that means that you were a professional and you were conscientious enough to go, okay, there's a mistake here. I'm not going to bother with the back and forth. I think it should be like this. I learned that years ago doing uh, industrial training films as a host mm -hmm. for the video. Right, right, right. You know. Yeah. 
So, um, so no, they're the same. They're the same. Good, good, good. Um, another demo related question. Is it okay to make your own audiobook demo or should it be done by a demo producer? Um, yes and yes and yes. Um, ultimately, <laughs> you need to be recording your demos in your home studio because so that's, that's the that's sound. You're auditioning your sound as well. Right. Yeah. But there's nothing that says you can't hire an audio producer to Skype in and coach you through the recording. Mm -hmm. Because the other aspect of this too is you're going to be doing the engineering and stuff on your own if, as a home studio based person. So what I say is you need to do it in your home studio, but that doesn't mean you can't hire someone like Johnny Heller or Carol Monda to come in or, you know, and work through you and coach you through till you get the right take. And then that's the one you go with. Right. Right. You know? Good, good, good. Yeah. And uh, James asks, what's percentage of your income is from audiobooks? He says, I enjoy it, but can you make good money? You know, uh, <laughs> well, I, I'm an anomaly because I went full time pretty, pretty soon after I started. So I would say for the longest time, about 90% of my income uh, came exclusively from audiobooks. Mm -hmm. But I was in the right place at the right time. Yeah. Um, no, there's no reason why you can't work full time. I, I had a really wonderful moment last month, uh, Steve Campbell, who was one of my students, he's a Canadian. When I met him, Steve was a, a housing contractor and he really wanted to do audiobooks. And so we started work and we did the whole year and he graduated and he went off and we had a check-in session just recently. And I said, so how's it going? He said, next week we'll celebrate the, uh, the three month anniversary of me working full time as a narrator. I haven't picked up a hammer in three months. Wow, that's great. So it, yeah, but but this is show business, guys. Yeah, and you can also, work. I get this. It it also is it also is um, it also is who are you? What mm -hmm. what is your life like? For instance, I love doing audiobooks. I was telling Sean that you know I, I went to Northwestern University and the interpretation of literature was a huge part of the curriculum there. So when I came to audiobooks, I was like, what we had for dinner every night? Let's do it. And um, early in my voiceover career. Uh, when, when, it, when it was kind of frontier, frontier land, when Sean was getting in, I was like, I love this, but my voiceover career was taking off too. I'm like, so I could make this much money doing this much work or this much money doing this much work. And right. so it wasn't until the whole industry shifted that I was like, audiobooks, I love those. Wait a minute. Yeah. And so everyone has going to have to find their balance of everyone's going to have to find their balance of um, how it fits in your life. I was telling Sean, you know, um, as I started, as I started going like, all right, let's do this. I started getting books and I, there was one year I was doing my own voiceover work. I was doing the dojo. I had two small kids and I got four books to record between Thanksgiving and New Year's. And I was like, yeah. Oh yes. No. Now we talk to people about how can I do things with multiple narrators? <laughs> and so everyone's going to have a different definition. And then one more thing, and we'll, right. we'll um, and to, to also understand, um, one of my dear friends is an audiobook publisher, but she started as a narrator and quite voluminous. And I would a not see her for months at a time, and then I'd get calls like, "Hi." I just need to talk to somebody because I've realized that my life circumstances are really exactly like being in solitary confinement and I'm going a little crazy. So you also have to find the balance. What it, you know, or you, you see people who do audiobooks and, and voiceover and be like, Oh, hi. Oh, I gotta go. Right. I gotta go. I gotta. So, so it's, 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 um, I'm a bit of a homebody. So it worked really well for me. And it, you know, we raised, uh, raised our kids and by working at home and uh, the, um, uh, but you know, one of the reasons I took up one-on-one -on -one coaching was I, I didn't need, I didn't need to talk to people. <laughs> and so, so yeah, I, you know, I'm on Skype with them, you know, anywhere from three to five students a day. And then I go record for a while. I don't record as much as I used to mm -hmm. um, because I, I, there's only so many hours in the day and I only have so much voice, but um right. Well, that's a whole thing. Uh, but, and, it, and it's also to answer a bigger part of his question is you have to define success for yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, I have students who are, they're older uh, men and women who want to do this part time in their retirement. But I have other people who want to do it full time and leave their day job. 
So it's about how you define success to right. begin with. And then knowing that you can work your butt off one year and make $10,000 or work your butt off and make $50,000. Right. You know, it, this is show business. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, um, let's see. Uh, there's one really interesting question that um, uh, about how you, like, what is a day in your life? Let me find it. Do you record every day at the near same time or how does, how do you oh. structure your work? So, when, so let's take the, let's take the, the world I was in before I started coaching. We only got a um, minute, so we need to. Okay. So the, um, yeah, uh, everybody has a biorhythm. You have peaks and valleys of energy throughout the day. And the trick is learning to know when they are or know how to adapt them so that you, when you record, you're at your peak. Mm. So for me, I tended to work really well in the early morning and in the late afternoon. So, and that also gave me a, a break in the middle where I didn't speak. I would rest my voice. So I'd get up in the morning, get the kids off on the bus, and then I'd go record for two, two and a half hours and knock out one finished hour of material. And then I'd take the afternoon off. I'd go run errands, go to the gym, take a nap, whatever, come back. When the kids came back in, got them settled. And then I would go out there in the late afternoon for another two to two and a half hour session. So, and then and sometimes in between, I would maybe prep something in the middle of the day or whatever, but I, to me, it's all about husbanding my voice throughout the day. Mm -hmm. I don't have one of those voices that can just talk for hours, although my family would disagree. <laughs> <laughs> I never shut up, but, but you have to be, for me, I have to be careful about that. Yeah. So it's, I, but it's a wrapped around to me where, when it was my peaks and valleys. of the Right. Of so, so it's not, it's not for, it's, it's for each of us to understand how we work and how our lives work. And right. the work needs to be done. Yeah. And some, you know, sometimes there's even, you know, because we're doing it for longer amounts of time, if you know, if you know the, the lawn blower guy is coming on Tuesday and you're, yes. booth, it, 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 then you just don't work there. Yeah. Um, real yeah. quick, Dan, um, uh, someone asked, how do we get into, Oh, wait, no, that's not, it's how do you, how do you, we'll, we'll get, we'll figure out, we'll close with how to get in touch with everybody. Um, but real quick, Dan, how would you engineer an audiobook different diff, uh, audiobook differently from a uh, commercial audition? Or is there a difference? Good question. Well, that's, you know, the thing is, is there really isn't a whole lot of difference up front in how you record something uh, for whether it's for an audio book or for uh, you know, a commercial or for long format narration. Everything is acoustics, mic technique, and setting proper levels. And there are certain little techniques that are different mic-wise uh, with audio books, especially if you're doing uh, a fiction. But for the most part, those are the three rules you need to adhere to. There's no secret sauce out there that says, oh, this is how you do an audio book. This is how you do this. This is how you do that. Uh, the idea is get the acoustics of your room right, learn how to properly use a microphone, and learn how to set levels. And then forget that the microphone is there and do what you're doing, which is being a voice actor. Right. And uh, try to get your system to the point where it really is out of sight, out of mind. All you're doing is hitting a record and going and doing what you're doing. But those, 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 are, those are a number of different things that you've got to concentrate on. And there really is the difference comes in how you master it for, uh, for the final product. And that you use the specific parameters that they give you from the publisher. I was just going to say it comes from that. Great. Excellent. Well, we're going to wrap up because we, we know you have busy lives. Um, so um, thank you guys so much for being here. Really, really lovely and, and mind expanding and heart expanding. Um, um, everything going on at the dojo, you can find out about at www.thevodojo.com. If you're just starting out, we are doing an encore of um, Actor's Secret Weapon, Voice Over the Actor's Secret Weapon, a two-hour workshop. We have You Should Do VoiceOver coming up in January. If you're interested in um, longer-term full training, Mystery to Mastery is happening. Um, so check out the website. Um, if you're in L.A., the holiday party is on the 12th. Um, and uh, Dan, how do people get in touch with you? Uh, they can go to my website, which is homevoiceoverstudio.com, uh, and click the contact, uh, contact button there, or you can email me directly at dan at danleonard.com, L-E-N-A-R-D. And also, uh, VOBS is every Monday, right? And voiceover body shop. <laughs> 
is every Monday night. Uh, <laughs> currently at uh, at uh, six p.m. We're going to be moving it to five p.m. on Monday night, uh, starting in January, and go to every other week. But we're going to be providing a lot more interesting content for you folks out there. Well, so. that's, well that's good. And Sean, how do people keep in touch with you? Thank you so much for sharing. Yes, uh, they can go to my website, which is seanprattpresents.com. And there's a contact page. They can send me an email. And they can also read about my services and what I offer and check out my demos and other things. You can find me on Facebook at Sean Pratt Presents. You can find me on Twitter at SP Presents. And, um, you know, there's multiple ways to get a hold of me. <laughs> I'm always active on social media. So, uh, and if you want to send me an email, uh, it's Sean Pratt at Comcast.net and I can send you some information. Yeah. yeah. And, um, someone is just asking, is there a recording? Yeah, this, the, we'll, we'll have this out. And if you've registered, we'll send it out as a recording. And one of the projects for, uh, Dojo, uh, next for 2019 is we're, uh, looking to have all these archived so that you can kind of look back at all of the Ask the Senseis. But we do this the first Wednesday of every month. Dan's here with me and we have a uh, different guest. So thank you. Thank you all. Uh, thank you guys so much. If you have any questions, uh, touch base with each of us and uh, we'll see you, see you next month. Thank you so much for attending, guys. <laughs> Bye. Great to see you, everybody. Take care.